Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss investment risk as it relates to tax planning and compliance, the, C the TCP exam. Now, investment risk is covered in a finance course, covered in a CFA course, covered in other courses as well. But here we're going to be looking at it from a tax planning perspective. Now, what is an investment risk? What is risk in general? What is the risk? A risk is a threat that's going to derail something you want to do, something you want to achieve, and something comes out of nowhere. It's called risk, and it's going to derail this. Now, when it comes to investment, you're going to lose your money. This is what the risk in an investment. You put some money, you put $5,000 away somewhere, or $5 million, you put $50,000, whatever that amount is, and you invest this amount. Later, you may get only 20000 Well, guess what? That's the risk. The risk is losing 30000 now, the level of the risk in finance, what we say is it's correlated to the return. Simply put, risk and return are directly correlated, directly correlated. What does that mean? It means if you take more of a risk and assuming here it's calculated risk, not if you want to go out, you know, outside and jump from a window, but if you take a calculated risk, it might lead to a higher return. For example, if you invest in stocks, you're taking more risk than putting your money at, in your home or in a bank account. So if you want to be safe, keep your money with you at all time. Put it under your pillow. You're safe. What is your return? Zero. You put it at the bank. You're safe. Your return is 1%. You invest this money in stocks, in companies, in your friend's stocks or in your friend's companies or in a stocks in the stock market. You're going to earn. There's the potential of earning higher return, but also there's the potential of losing everything. Also, with the same token, lower risk usually align with lower return. So if you put money in a savings account, you can sleep better. It's safer. So we have to keep that in mind that higher risk, higher return, lower risk is lower return. Understanding and quantifying the risk is part of the investment planning because when you are helping someone, now as a CPAs, we don't give any investment advice, but we have to make sure the client is aware of the type of investment they are getting into. What we look at is we look at two main type of investment risk, or we classify risk under two main type. We have non-systematic risk and we have systematic risk. So understanding those risks, and we actually, in some, some investment firms, they try to quantify them for you, give you like a risk score for your investment. But we need to understand from our perspective what is non-systematic and what is systematic risk. And this is what we will discuss in this session, including examples. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Let's start by discussing non-systematic risk. This is the risk that an individual company or an industry faces. So this risk is specific to you. It's also known as the business risk. Why it's called business risk? Because it's related to your business, whatever you do. It's not related to the entire market or economy. So the reason you're thinking is because you are thinking yourself as a company, not because the economy is not doing well and you're going down with everyone else. Now, how can you diversify and if you want to invest if you are facing non-systematic risk in a company. So if you want to invest and you want to eliminate or reduce this non-systematic risk, what you do is you don't put all your money in one company. What do you do? So rather than, let's assume, that rather than putting your money in company A, all of your money, you choose company A, company B, company C, company D, and company E. So you put maybe 20% in A, 20% in B, 20% in C, 20% in D, 20% in E. Now, again, uh, when you diversify, it's not it's not that. It's not 20%. There are other factors. But the point is you put your money in different companies and in, in different industries. Doing what? Spreading the risk. So if company A or industry A did not do well, maybe company B and C will do better. Company D, okay. And company E will do very good. So it, it will average out. So spreading your risk across many different industries or asset types, like you might invest in stocks and bonds and real estate and gold, this will reduce 
your non-systematic risks. But what is non-systematic risk? We need to know this. One is product risk. What is a product risk? This occurs when a company future success or failure is tied or heavily tied to a performance of a single product or a small range of products. So simply put, the company has one or two products that they rely on. A case in point, pharmaceutical company. Pharma a lot of pharmaceutical companies, small, ph small pharmaceutical companies to be specific, heavily rely on the success of one patented drug. If that drug gets approval from the U.S. government, they do great. If not, they don't do well. Versus large, large pharmaceutical companies, like a company like Johnson & Johnson, my wife works at Johnson & Johnson, they have many different lines of product. Medical equipments, drugs, personal consumers, so on and so forth. So they are heavily diversified within the company. So they don't really face a product risk as a company. Competitive risk. What's competitive risk? This happens when the competitive landscape changes not to your favor. So a company might face significant risk if new competitors enter the market with a superior product or superior technology. You might be happy now that you have selling this product, but suddenly you have a competitor that's selling a better product at a cheaper rate. That's called competitive risk. It's going to drive you down or out of business. Default risk. If you invest in a company and you bought their bond, there's the risk that the company may not be able to pay you back your money or the interest. That's it. That's that's a default risk that's specific to that company. It's a non-systematic risk. The company could have management risk. What does that mean? For example, if they, lo if they lose a key executive, for example, uh, Elon Musk no longer working for Tesla. That's a problem. Could, could be a problem for Tesla. So this is called a management risk. Or if you discontinue a major product line with this executive leaves, that's also a risk. There is all, all sorts of risks that are non-systematic specific to a company, like supply chain risk, there's something happened to your supply chain. You're not being able to get the raw material. You can be sued. You could have a reputational risk where the company is hacked and now your customer's information is exposed to the public. You could have many non-systematic risks. Many of them are just listed twice, a listed few of them. So how can an individual address this non-systematic risk by diversifying? You diversify, you don't put your money in one basket, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, that's what they say, and this is how you diversify non-systematic risk. So what is systematic risk? System, systematic, the whole system is going down. The best thing I want you to think of when you think of systematic risk, maybe you remember this, maybe not, the financial crisis that happened 2007, 2008, the housing crisis, where all the homes in the U.S., and across the world went down in value and all the stock markets across the globe went down in value. Those are risks that affect the entire market or economy and cannot be mitigated through diversification. It doesn't matter in 2007, 2008, whether you were invested in technology, real estate, which is the most effective, electronics, retailers, cigarettes, any other industry you were, you were invested in, it was affected. So what are some examples of systematic risk? So what could create systematic risk? Political risk. This refers to the risk of losing money due to the changes in government policies or political instability. For example, if there is a major change in the economy, the government changes certain policies, it's affecting every industry, that's a systematic risk. For example, a new tax policy or regulation could affect an entire sector and that sector could bring down the whole economy. Or political unrest, political unrest, civil wars, chaos, can disrupt the economic activities in that country. It doesn't matter what company you are, airline, pharmaceutical, technology, real estate, it's all affected. This is called political risk. We could have a market risk. This is the risk of investment declining in value due to economic development that affect the entire economy. Here you could have many reasons for this. For example, a significant stock crash can affect almost all stocks. So the stock started to go down, all the stocks will go down because companies, uh, individuals will start to sell because they want to get out before it goes lower and the machine feeds itself on the way down. Currency risk. If you're investing in a company and you have significant foreign sales, for example, you have a lot of sales, let's assume in Russia, okay? You have billions of, of uh, Russian rubles, right? That's a great. Now, let's assume you, you rely on your Russian market and suddenly the Russian currency went down in value. Now you want to translate this billions into US dollar, it might be a few millions. What happened is you're still selling in Russia, but the currency went down in value, you lost actual return 
because when you convert the currency, maybe th this billion was used to be, let's assume, 500 million on the current exchange rate. Now it's 100 million. So you lost a lot. That could affect your return. Inflation risk, also known as the purchasing power risk. This is the danger that inflation would erode the real value of your return. Also, if you are working, let's assume, in the U.S., and you're making a billion dollar in, 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 in profit or revenue. Well, that billion dollar, if inflation went up, it's worth less. Socio-political risk or geopolitical risk, I would say it's related to, to the political risk. Sometimes it goes by different name. Events like political upheaval or social unrest can also impact the financial market and investor attitude, influencing the entire stock market, not a particular company. It doesn't matter how well or not well you are doing. The entire market will be affected. Liquidity risk, this is the risk that an investor may not be able to buy or sell their investment quickly because there is liquidity. What's liquidity? Enough people to buy and sell, enough people in the market. Why? They left the market. They're not comfortable dealing with that market. So what happened if you want to buy or sell, let's assume you want to sell your stock and no one is buying it, the, the price, you'll have to drop your price and the price might drop substantially because liquidity dry up, the price will go down it's going to affect all stocks. Even if your company is doing well, there's no, and you want to sell the stock, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the company. There's a liquidity crisis. And this is basically what happened 2007, 2008. It started with a liquidity crisis. I'm not going to go into this if you're interested. You know, YouTube, Farhat, and, uh, you know, the housing market, and you will see what happened. How can you mitigate systematic risk? It's a little bit harder. Diversification don't shield you from systematic risks, but you can you can use derivatives or short selling that can help you. For example, you can short sell the entire market. For example, you can short sell the S&P 500 or even the Nasdaq. What is short selling? There's, for example, there is a one one ETF exchange traded fund called QQQ that represent the Nasdaq. Well, what you can do. If you think the Nasdaq is going to go down, you can short, don't do it, you can short this QQQ and as a result, if the Nasdaq goes down, you can short the QQQ and this investment, the QQQ is long, but you can short it. It means sell it now and buy it later. So if you sell it now and buy it later and if it did went down, you buy it at a lower rate. You make up for your losses. So this is how you can mitigate systematic risk so if the market is declining derivatives might provide gains and short selling what is what is derivatives uh, we talked about this in a separate session but derivatives is when you buy the option to sell your stocks your you, to sell your investment at a particular price now there's a price you pay for that there's a fee but sometimes it's worth it to protect your gains because if the stocks indeed went down you can still sell them at a particular price and this this is going to help you it could yield return under these conditions now, when you invest, what can you invest in? We're going to break investments into two categories. We have many, but usually we're going to say stocks and bonds. When we say stocks, it means equity. What are equity securities? It's a form of an investment commonly known as stocks represent ownership in a company. So when you buy a stock, you're essentially buying a piece of that company. You are an owner in that company and that ownership gives you a claim <laughs> on the earnings of the company. You're the owner. You would expect to receive some type of, of a profit, part of the profit. So the amount you own and your entitlement to the company's profit are proportional to the number of shares you held comparable to the total number of shares. So if you have a, if there are a million shares for that company and you happen to own 100,000, you own 10% of that company. Equity securities, the value of your investments can fluctuate significantly. And this, this is what you have to know about stocks is they fluctuate. It goes up and down depending on how well the company is doing. If the company performs well, the value should increase and the value of your share should increase, allowing you to benefit from its growth. And this can be seen how when the stock appreciate in value or they pay out more dividend. For example, if you own shares in a tech startup that becomes highly successful, the value of your share could increase substantially. Now, on the flip side, there's a risk of losing your entire investment. In equity stocks, you could lose everything. The, the company could go bankrupt. So if the company fails or goes bankrupt, its stock value might plummet, potentially down to zero. Believe me, I had stocks that went down to zero. I invested in a company called Lehman Brothers when they were going out of business and I lost the money there. It went out to zero. In such a case, a shareholder, you could lose all your money you invested in a company stock. So what does that mean? Equity securities are the riskiest. So as an example of the scenario, 
could be a retail company that fails due to poor management and intense competition from e-retailers from Amazon, and the stock could become worthless. And many, many retailers went out of business, specifically electronics retailers, like a Radio Shack, that, that company no, lo no longer exists, as well as others. How about bonds? So you could invest in stocks or you could invest in bonds. Bonds are a little bit, little bit less riskier than stocks. Bonds are essentially loaning money to the, to, the, to, the, to the borrower, which is the company, or you can buy government bond. So when you purchase a bond, you are lending money to the issuer in exchange for future payment. Now, these payments typically include regular interest and the return of the bond face value. So when you lend someone money, you expect to get interest in return and you expect to get your money back. The term of the bond, like the interest rate and the maturity date, will be specified in the contract. A bond could be for 5 years, could be for 50 years, could be for 15 years. It could be paying 6%, it could be paying 8%, so on and so forth. It's a contract. It's somebody is borrowing money. Now, for simplicity, we're going to look at two types of bonds. Corporate bonds, which is bonds issued by companies, and municipal bonds. Now, I want you to bear in mind, before we discuss this, we have many corporate bonds Municipal bonds are less in flavors, but court, we have many, many corporate bonds. So let's talk about corporate bonds first. As I mentioned, we have many types. These are issued by companies in a way to raise money, again, to borrow money. Instead of taking out a bank loan, what they will do, they will go to the public, to you and I, and they would say, you know what? How about you lend us money? If you like our company, lend us money. This can be more advantageous for the company because they don't have to rely on a bank. They might, you know, because the bank may refuse to lend them the whole money. But when they go outside and borrow from many people, they can finance their operation or project. And it might give them a better interest rate compared to the bank loan because the loan, the bank is taking a lot of risk by lending you all the money. However, the interest you can earn from corporate bond is subject to both federal and state income taxes. So you have to know this. Now, why do you have to know this? Because when we're going to look at the municipal bond, it's a little bit different. So corporate bonds are subject to taxation, federal and state. For example, in, if you invest in a technology company, you buy their bonds, you're subject to both federal and state. How about municipal bonds? So what are municipal bonds? Municipal bonds are bonds issued by government, local government, cities, states, localities. These bonds are used to do what? Finance the public, public project like roads, schools, and infrastructure. So here's what's going to happen. Because they are for the public purpose, they have two key advantages. One, they are often exempt from federal taxes. So the federal government says, you know what? Because you are a local government and you are serving the public, because if you don't serve the public, guess who's going to have to serve the public? Us, the federal government. So since you are doing this, guess what? We are going to waive the taxes the investors give you. So when, when you're an investor and you buy those bonds, the federal government says, you buy those bonds, guess what? We're gonna, all the money that you earn on these bonds will be tax-free for the federal government. Now, in many cases, you could also have, you could, the taxes could be tax-free for many state and local taxes, but we can't make that general generalities un unless they tell you in the problem. Also, the state and the locality is tax-free for them. So that's why, they make them, they are attractive. That's one. Two, they are safer than corporate bonds. Think about it. You're only, you're, you're lending money to a government unit. The government, they can do anything. What anything? Raise taxes. So if they don't have revenue, they could just raise taxes to pay you back the money. So municipal government can raise taxes to pay off the bond. So it's safe. That's one thing. And it's for federal tax purposes. It's tax free for federal tax purposes. So it gives it two advantages. Now, obviously, because it's safer, it's going to give you a lower return. Therefore, when you are investing in whether municipal bond or a corporate bond, you have to look at your return before tax, before tax, and after tax, and compare to see which one is a better option. How about the tax treatment? An interesting aspect of the tax treatment happens when businesses borrow money to invest in bonds. So when you borrow money and you invest in bonds, if a business borrows money to buy corporate U.S. bond, the interest it earns is taxable, obviously we told you this, but the interest expense is also deductible. So because the interest is taxable, because they make you pay interest, they allow you to deduct the interest. However, if you borrow money to invest in municipal bond, now what you're doing, you're trying to earn a profit, you're not trying to contribute money to the general public because you borrowed money, you're going above and beyond to invest. Well, the interest you earn, we're gonna give it to you tax exempt, that's fine, that's the promise. However, because you borrowed the money, 
to invest in those municipal bonds, the interest expense that you borrowed is not deductible. So you cannot have it both ways, where you can get tax-exempt interest, then borrow money and have an interest deduction on the other side. You can't do that. For example, if a company borrows fund to invest in a municipal bond for the new public transportation project, the interest it earns won't be taxed. That's fine. However, the interest they pay to borrow the bonds cannot be deducted. See, it's not taxable, but the interest that you pay to borrow this money to invest, it's not deductible. It's, I would say it's fair. Let's take a look at this multiple choice questions from farhatlectures.com. What is the main reason companies issue corporate bonds? So why do companies issue bonds? Do we know this? Is it to, to diversify their investment portfolio? Hold on a second. We are issuing bond. We're not buying bond. Issuing means selling. We are issue bond. We're selling bonds. So it's not to diversify our investment portfolio. To avoid paying dividend to shareholders. That's not, they're not connected. <laughs> you, on the contrary, if you're issuing bond, you're bringing cash, you might pay the shareholders. So it has nothing to do with avoiding paying dividend to the shareholders. To raise fund for project and operation. Is this the main reason? 100%. Why do you borrow money? Issuing bonds is borrowing money from the public. To raise fund, to bring the money for the project and operation. I would say C is a good answer, but let's look at D. To increase the stock price. Well, <laughs> if that's the case, companies will keep borrowing money. I mean, at, at, to a point, maybe borrowing money and and taking this money and funding a project and operation could increase the stock price, but that's not the main reason they do it. Uh, they want to raise the fund to maybe sometimes just to survive, not to increase the stock price. It could lead to that, but the, pro the main purpose is to raise funds. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures and look at additional MCQs. That's going to help you understand this concept better, whether you are studying for your CPA exam, accounting courses, tax courses, enrolled agent, or any other professional certification. FarhatLectures.com is always here to help. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.